History of Organic Production, Developed and Narrated by Julie Larson. Before the Industrial Revolution, farming was pretty much done on a 40-acre basis. Um, this was pretty manageable for a family to handle. Uh, the farms were very diversified. Uh, most of them were subsistence, so you ate what you grew. Anything that was over that, you would try and sell. Um, but pretty much, uh, they did a lot of things. So they did dairy, they did, um, you grew the crops to feed your livestock. Uh, you also, uh, maybe you would do some wheat for sale or uh, some grain. They used manure from their livestock for the fertilizer, that is, if it was needed. Uh, because this was most of it was very uh, the virgin soils, very um, fertile, especially in the Midwest area. They used uh, man and horse for labor, so there was no uh, tremendous compaction of the soils, much easier to work, um, a lot of nutrients within the soils, uh, very productive overall. So by the mid 1800s, uh, this brought in the, the industrial age and also the dawn of synthetics. So you had a gentleman named uh, Justin von uh, Liebig and he was a chemist who uh, broke down what the plants required into basic chemistry. So he really felt that it was all about the, the NPK, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium were what the plants really needed and that he realized you could create this for, with synthetic methods. Uh, no longer did you need the manure, you could just um, add these chemicals in different ratios to achieve the best nutrients for those plants. What he wasn't really taking into account was all the other things going on in the composted manure, a lot of living matter, um, the microbes, the, the uh, things that were needed to continue breaking down and allow the plants to take up some of these chemicals. Uh, so it, but it was a huge shift from just using the organic, uh, old-fashioned way of composting manure and then spreading it on your fields, or just spreading manure and letting it rest. Uh, this changed things tremendously. Now farmers could just buy those chemicals and spread them on their uh, fields to get the um, increased yield. Uh, and nitrogen was in the form of ammonia. Now we use ammonia hydra and hydrous uh, that we drill into the ground to uh, fertilize the fields. So by the 1920s and 1930s, the uh, landscape of farming was really beginning to change. Uh, no longer uh, was the 40-acre uh, plot the typical. Now, because of increased uh, machinery and chemicals, uh, farmers could, could handle more land. They could farm much bigger acreage. Uh, they began to specialize. specialize. Uh, so they didn't grow everything they needed. They grew just a few crops that they could sell. Uh, some Many of the farmers still would have their their garden for their own use, or maybe they would have a cow for milking. But for the most part, their income was coming from the one or two crops that they were specializing in. Also, the machines got bigger and bigger to work the larger acreage. After several years of uh, rain in what was considered a pretty semi-arid uh, region of the United States, the section of the Great Plains, which included southeast Colorado, southwest Kansas, the panhandles of Texas and 
um, Oklahoma and also even northeast New Mexico, uh, these areas had, had been having uh, unseasonable weather, a lot of rain, and this brought the realtors to say that this was the, the plow, rain followed the plow, meaning that as they were plowing up this area, it seemed like uh, this area became more rainy, the, and which was completely uh, just a phenomenon of the time. And, but it also brought in many, many immigrants came into this area and started tilling up what had been grasslands that had very deep root systems and was able to hold that 20 inches of rain typically a year um, to make it look like it was very lush. After that, they had gone in and tilled uh, year after year, and now when the rains, uh, the un unusually rainy period ended, uh, drought set in. And so when the drought set in, there was nothing any longer to hold that moisture in the ground, and big, huge dust storms would start. And it began to, and this happened, it displaced many families. Uh, some of the times the huge dust storms could be seen and felt all the way to New York City. Uh, but it got people thinking that maybe something was wrong with this, what was going on in agriculture. Um, a lot of questions were raised about the, uh, is the soil healthy? Is tilling it up the right method to really keep... Um, keep the soil where it should be. And those questions, I think, started really people going, hmm, is this, is this the only way to do farming? Or can we fix this problem? While those questions had been raised, things pretty much occurred uh, just as they had been. Uh, after World War II, uh, the petrochemicals had been, uh, they were very inexpensive and plentiful. Many of these chemicals had been, uh, um, been used in World War II, so they had a lot of extra, and were trying to figure out ways to use them. And farming seemed to be the, the best way possible. And so the farmers were encouraged uh, to continue using these uh, chemicals to increase their yields. And of course, the large chemical companies began to fund a lot of the research, uh, which, uh, especially in some of the colleges and universities, and uh, this created a firm hold on the farming industry in the United States. In 1962, Silent Spring was released. Uh, Rachel Carson had taken on the chemical industry that produced pesticides indiscriminately uh, that were spread all over the farmland, uh, killing not only the pests they were intended for, but all other uh, insects that were uh, living in that area. Uh, she said they uh, realized that the overuse of this, uh, including DT, DDT, uh, could lead to insect uh, and pest resistance to these terrible chemicals, and that there was a huge human um, uh, problem with these pesticides also. Uh, research was starting to show that DDT was causing uh, liver tumors in mice. So in 1963, Rachel Carson, she testified before the Senate, and um, DDT was, uh, not long after, was uh, forbidden for use on pests. In 1970, the EPA was created. Uh, there was a huge outcry about that, we, that the United States needed to have some overseeing agency to monitor uh, these chemicals that we were putting all over the land. 
and also started to see in the 60s and 70s a back to the land movement people moving away from the industrialization uh, that they were of, of farming and going back to smaller plots of land uh, living on what they grew uh, Helen and Scott Nearing were instrumental in in uh, bringing people to realize that they could uh, they could live off the land. So finally, in the 1970s and 80s, the organic groups were beginning to unite. The groups before had been kind of um, spread out and had their own particular uh, causes that they were interested in. But in 1971, Acres USA began, and they were uh, the first group to really look at large-scale organic production and um, how it can be done through uh, distributing their publication. Uh, 1971 and 72, Maine and California formed the first organic associations uh, that created a uniform standards of production. And in 1972, IFOM, International Federation of Agricultural Movements, is a global cooperation that uh, also has created some standards and pr uh, started producing some information for people all over the world, not just in the United States. In the 1980s and 90s, the government starts to get involved. And this was mainly because organic uh, markets were beginning to expand. Uh, people wanted to buy uh, organic um, products, but there was no overseeing standards for uh, as a national organization. So the USDA um, began getting more and more questions regarding organic food. So what they got inundated with questions about what does it mean to be organic, what is the what are the growing methods, uh, but because their organic groups were doing things differently all over, uh, it was very hard for them to answer the questions. So they put out a report and recommendations on organic farming that uh, they uh, studied the market for a long time and uh, started making recommendations for what they thought would be uh, a good place to start for standards. Um, in 1990, the U.S. Organic Foods Protection Act was signed, and the whole purpose of that was to come up with standards that would be for uh, national standards that would oversee uh, organic foods that would be labeled as organic and what that would mean. So then the National Organic Program began, NAP, and that was uh, making recommendations, uh, strict recommendations for people to follow that would allow their products to be labeled organic, certified organic. And then also put into place was the National Organic Standards Board uh, that would oversee the standards. And um, because things change periodically, they look at different chemicals that are allowed to be used for pesticides and herbicides, um, the way that the farming is done to make sure that it still fits within what they believe fits into the certified organic label. And that brings us up to today. So uh, is there's some the organic uh, certified organic farms and products that are produced uh, are growing each year. So in 2013, 18,513 organic farms and processing facilities are in the United States. Uh, increase of 245 percent since 2002 and even worldwide over 25,000 certified organic operators 
are working today. And that's looking at over more than 120 countries. Looking at this map of the United States, uh, this was put out by the USDA in 2013. Uh, you can see the Midwest has uh, into the uh, uh, East Coast. A lot of certified organic farms, as well as the West Coast. Of course, you would think uh, California, New York is huge, uh, Wisconsin, many operations. So the USDA um, also looks has created a graph. Uh, 2002 to 2012, looking at the increase in the number of uh, operations uh, for these 10 years, and certainly increasing uh, big, few places, big jumps, and now it's starting to uh, still increasing. Um, I guess some could say that it's beginning to uh, level off, but we also a great graph would be to look at would be acreage. If these operations are maybe not increasing uh, by the number of operations as much, but maybe by as many acreage, as much acreage that they're farming or their uh, operation um, or production has increased. This is only looking at the number of operations, not how much the operations are producing.